to this week's edition of Naughty Boy Fight Picks. Uh, not much to um, begin with today, we'll probably just crack into it. Gonna cover my picks for UFC 227 this coming weekend, of course, coming off a loss last week at UFC Calgary. Um, uh, the biggest I've streaked in my short betting career is three and I thought last week I was gonna crack the elusive four events in a row but it wasn't to be so back to the drawing board uh, as per usual well I was gonna say I've gone a little bit conservative this week with my picks but not really but it's kind of, I feel quite covered anyhow by my safe picks. And then I've got some outrageous ones. Well, one really outrageous one. And yeah, then there's some that are a bit of a gamble. But we'll get into it. Um, where are we? So going straight into it. And then I'll have a look at the card and go through and just bring up any points of interest. Not going to make picks for all the fights I haven't had time to look at everything so but yeah some quite exciting card uh just hard to say at the moment there's some real good stuff on this card but wondering whether it will surpass last week's because last week's was such a good card particularly for something that wasn't pay-per-view I mean like I know uh Poirier and Alvarez probably aren't huge pay-per-view draws but they should be but I don't think anyone on... There's not a huge draw on this card, really, either. We know that DJ doesn't bring the numbers in, and I don't think Dillashaw and Garbrandt really do either. So it be interesting to see how badly this flops. Apparently last week was a big flop also. So without further ado, we'll get into the picks. Um, just bringing up my profile here. I'm a bit more organized than usual. Well, I thought I was, but I didn't have that pulled up. Well, yeah, we'll see how we go. All right, end of the video today, too. Want to get into some comments. We've got some good ones, and I ran out of time to do them on my recap video. So, uh, got some good feedback, too, about the new segment, the Don't Care Department. So, thanks for that. I'm glad people enjoyed that. Uh, I will, in future, look to do more segments, because they keep things interesting and, yeah, more entertaining, I believe. Um... So what do we got here? Okay, so I've made a play on Jose Shorty Torres versus Alex Perez. I have some notes here somewhere, I believe. Yeah, so Alex Perez, he's 20 and four. He's on a seven fight win streak. Uh, of those four losses, he's been subbed three times. Uh, Torres got some submissions on his record, but yeah. Uh, Perez probably the better, more skilled ground fighter. So he has a lot of um, submission wins also. Uh, he has real good wrestling. He's a fast starter, so he just comes out the blocks and gets into it, which um, could be a concern against Torres, maybe, depending on how you look at it. Uh, he's scrappy in the pocket. He die hard, goes after subs. Real busy on the ground with... Um, uh, hitting his opponent and then improving position as well. Uh, he's fighting close to home here. Uh, lots of experience, but maybe not at a super high level. Uh, so his regional experience, not as um, impressive, I don't think, as Torres's in Titan FC. But debatable. Um, what is he... So he's 2-0 in the UFC thus far, and of course he had that win in the Contender Series. Uh, Perez looks quite hittable on the feet, so in that fight against Shelton, um, early on Shelton just kept landing that right hand at will it seemed. Um, and I think Torres has a better right hand than Shelton probably. Maybe not as long, but yeah. Uh, Perez's striking looks alright. Um, I feel he mostly uses it as a mechanism to get the fight into a grappling position. Uh, in the footage I watched of him, he hardly ever threw straight punches. He mostly leads with hooks, which could be a problem. Pere uh, sorry, Torres has a really nice jab once he gets going. Once he gets going, that is. Though. Um, 
Uh, he's a pressure fighter. He's constantly applying pressure and looking to come forward, which would be interesting because uh, Torres does the same thing. Um, he's got some real sneaky wrestling entries, so he'll just like, sort of pick up a single leg out of nowhere real fast. Um, and it just it looked off beat and, um, yeah, looked to really catch his opponent by surprise, so look for those. Um, yeah, and Perez doesn't appear to have big punching power at all. Obviously, these are small guys, um, but I do believe uh, Torres has a bit of, bit of power in his shots. Anyhow, on to Shorty Torres. Um, he's 8-0. He's a Titan FC champ in two divisions, and he got that. So he went. He got the belt at 125 there. Oh, excuse me, I just drank a crazy coffee because I have been working um, many hours over the last couple of days. Excuse me if I'm a little jaded today. You can probably see it in my eyes, actually. Yeah. Um. Sorry. The. So yeah, and just his fifth ever professional fight he went up to the one 135 in Titan and got the second belt there um yeah what to make of that I think there's decent competition in Titan and just I think that experience of um holding titles that confidence that comes with that and you can see in those fights like following them and he's talking about where he's going he's got a very clear picture Kind of reminds me of um, Arasanya, that he's just very sure and um, certain of where he's headed and determined about it too, which I really like. Um, he so prior to uh, his professional career, he had a really long unbeaten amateur record. Which make of that what you want? Um, he's really good at escaping bad positions he stay, stays really calm if he gets caught in a sub and um, works his way out if he gets taken down same thing he'll uh, work his way back to his feet um, yeah and like not with not with that crazy urgency but more methodical so he kind of it's as though he evaluates things and then works his way out um, could be trouble for him versus Perez Perez is nasty on the ground um, he's got good hips, so he can uh, can stop a lot of takedowns. Real good chin. So I think after that UFC, after his UFC debut, you heard him talking and saw him talk about it a bit during his Titan career too. And he's kind of like, I don't really get going until I get cracked, and that seems to be true from what I've watched of him. Uh, while I'm on that topic too. Um, so something I kind of hate and love about this gambling thing is doing all the tape because quite often you find yourself watching fights you don't really want to watch but doing tape on Shorty Torres was fucking fun like this dude is a fan friendly fighter um, he's so fun to watch and entertaining all his fights are great I didn't see like a boring round, a boring moment, just as all action. Uh, so yeah, good chin, really durable. Um, can be a slow starter. He has also like first round finishes and stuff, but in um, fights that go a few rounds and he's got the, I think that title, the second title was a five round fight. Um, he typically loses the first round and then gets going in the second and just starts turning it on his opponent. Uh, quite reminiscent of Gaethje, like he gets his opponents into a war of attrition. So he doesn't mind getting hit early on, losing a round. He remains confident that uh, in continuing forward that eventually his opponent is going to break. And so far, so good. Um, he... Uh, yeah, so his UFC debut, he got tagged up and taken down in the first round. It looked terrible, so I wasn't super familiar with him then. I did know of him. I'd seen, like, highlights and shit, but I was like, oh, this guy's going to lose his debut. And and you saw him turn it around in the second round. I think it was on its way there. That's obviously speculation, but upon watching his um, older fights, 
it very much looked like it was following that typical pattern, the way his fights go. So um, he got that win, of course. It was a bit lucky, but yeah. Um, he had beautiful punches to the body. Uh, last week was the week of the body punch, obviously. So uh, hopefully Shorty Torres brings that beautiful technique to bear this weekend. Um, he's real composed under pressure. Uh, like I said, he reminds me quite a bit of Gaethje. Um, he wears damage well, keeps pressuring. Uh, and he just, yeah, so he, like, way different fighting style, but like Tony Ferguson, you know? You see Ferguson getting a rhythm, and it just ascends and ascends and ascends. Like, he gets better round by round. And interestingly... I feel like to that effect, Torres would be, I wouldn't be surprised to hear him say he would prefer five round fights. I think that would favor him against all, if not most opponents, just because the way his style is that he gets in a rhythm and gets more comfortable and begins throwing in combination and then he starts varying the combinations throwing in different techniques and it just keeps increasing and getting better it's like um, painting a picture in there it's beautiful um, what was I going to say yeah so his right hand is really fast and really powerful and like I said before real nice jab as well and I think those two punches could really give um, Perez trouble if he is trying to be the guy applying the pressure and Torres is doing the same, I think he's going to keep eating those shots, and particularly the right hand. And that might stop him coming forward. And if he stops coming forward, then it's Torres' fight all day, I believe. Um, as long as Torres can uh, stay on his feet, of course. Um, yeah, so... As I was speaking to what I was talking about before, as um, Torres comes on and his combinations start to get better and more varied, he starts to mix in a lot of kicks and punches in the same combos and super effective. Um, what else? He's training with um, Dillashaw, Curtis Blades, all those guys. I think that's probably a good look for him as well. A round championship mentality, which he already has, um, not in the UFC, but you know. Uh, I think. This is like a typical Shorty Torres fight. I think it's going to look hairy in the first round for him. And then he will begin to turn the tide. It's a little concerning betting on that sort of fighter. Because it's a three round fight. And Perez is obviously real dangerous. Um, he locks up subs and yeah gets guys out of there. But I don't think he's going to do that to Torres. And I think Torres will survive some bad positions in the early on in the fight begin to turn the tide and um, Perez won't be able to handle uh, that sort of fight so that's the first bet we got on there um, moving along I have a play on Shaman De Silva Marais uh, he's fighting Matt Sales we'll just go on to my notes here um, so Sales uh, this is his UFC debut. He's uh, he kept coming off the contender series, of course, where he got that early knockout um, against the, I think it was an Indian fella. Um, so he's young, 24 years old. Training partner of Dominic Cruz at Alliance. Uh, he's got a seven and one record, and his last loss was just two fights ago. Um, that loss was to a pretty unimpressive guy. I forget his name, but he's the wrestling coach at Tiger Muay Thai in Thailand. Um, yeah, and just... So I think it was 2016. So a couple years ago, young guy. But uh, that loss gave me a lot of confidence and um, shaman for this fight. Uh, six of his seven wins are by KO. Um... Uh, and from what I saw, he has this very powerful right hand. This is a 145er. Um, but I didn't really see much evidence of him setting up that right hand. So 
uh, I think if you didn't if you didn't know and you watched uh, uh, Matt Sale what's his name yeah Matt Sale's fight or Shane Sale's fuck who cares Sale's um, if you were watching him and not really paying attention to his size or even just the way he fights would deceive you because he kind of fights like a plodding I don't know, light heavyweight, heavyweight even. Like, he doesn't physically look like those divisions, but his style, man, it's um, real plotty, it's pot shotting, uh, not much diversity in the striking, and he just kind of relies on the on the power and the right hand, and I think at 145, that's a recipe for disaster for him, especially against a guy like Marais, who has really, really nice... Um, kickboxing uh, pedigree. I believe he's a kickboxing champion um, and that's his background. So going to the notes on Marais, he's 9-2. and two. Um, His two losses, so one was to Marlon Marais in um, uh, World Series of Fighting and then his uh, second loss was in his debut to Zabit. So he's been in there with really tough guys. Both those fights so, yeah, Zabit subbed him at the end of the third, and I think same with the Marais fight. So, he's hung in there with, like, high, high-level guys, and I don't think Sal's been anywhere near that level of competition. And interestingly, in the Zabit fight, so I think everyone's familiar with Zabit in his fights, he appears to... So, he's a showman, and he... Is obviously, I get the impression that Zabit early on, these early fights he's had in the UFC, he's kind of showcasing his skills. He's showing um, how well rounded his game is, that he can beat opponents wherever the fight goes. In the fight with Marais, he spent way more, he was way more focused on the ground fighting and the grappling than the striking. He struck a little with Marais and he had difficulty hitting him. And like he did land some stuff, but so did Marais. The the striking between those two didn't look super uneven. So and I think that's why Zabit uh, uh, went to control him on the ground more than um, try and stand with him. So his stand ups like really legit. Uh, Marais's nine wins. He has five by KO, so he has power as well. Uh, he had that tough debut versus Zabit. Like what a fucking nightmare. Uh, match up for your debut. Uh, real nice Muay Thai style striking, beautiful kicks, good movement. Um, he's got good scrambles too, so in those scrambles with Zabit, he did mount Zabit, albeit for a very short time. Um, he did get on top of him, which is not nothing. Um, yeah, so I just think Shaman's striking is going to be way too advanced for. Uh, for Hale, what's his fucking name? I keep forgetting it. Excuse me. Sales. Um, yeah, I think his skill set is pretty fucking pedestrian, and I think it does appear that he has some wrestling, um, but he prefers to stand, and yeah, I think that's just going to cost him. I don't think he'll be able to get this fight to the ground for any sustained amount of time and that Marais is going to piece him up on the feet, maybe fucking kick his head off. So, yeah, got three units there on uh, fucking Marais, Shaman, Marais. Um, and to my other picks, we're going a couple units on Brett Johns versus Pedro Munoz. Um, this one, a little... I know, it's close, but I'm, I'm back in John's here. So, just going into the notes, um, Munoz is 15-3, and three, ranked number 9 in the division. Uh, he's coming off a loss to John Dodson, which I believe was a pretty close fight. Um, uh, Munoz has never been finished. All those three losses have been to a very elite competition. He was on a four-fight win streak until his last fight. Very tough and scrabby. 
He has nine subs and two KOs. Um, he ju jumps on a submission really fast. He, his last fight versus Dodson, he missed weight and then lost the fight. So that was something interesting. Is he too big for this division? He is getting a bit older. Um, yeah, he had, he had trouble with the speed and movement of Dodson early in that fight. Uh, but he did begin to wear Dodson out a bit, I think, just with that uh, pressure style constantly moving forward. As for Johns, he is 15 and 1. I uh, took that, took his first loss in that last, I believe it was his last fight against Aljamain. Um, really, like, he had a real philosophical attitude towards taking his first loss, too. It was kind of like he had mentally prepared himself. Not in a negative way, but he was like, you know, you're gonna, this sport, you will lose one day. He's like, and it's just part of it. Kind of like that about him. Uh, he obviously got that crazy calf slicer submission versus Joe Soto. Real good hand speed, which I think could trouble Munoz early on. Johns is very young, but experienced for his age. Um, I think if, yeah, I think Johns will still be developing and will continue to keep looking better. Um, He's also a, a guy that likes to come forward like Munoz. Uh, yeah, good chin on Johns. Also has a beautiful rip to the body. Uh, and what I really liked about that loss to Aljo was Johns' response to that adversity was to turn it up and he the harder the fight got, the harder he fought. And I think that's a real good asset to see in a guy. Um, I mean, Munoz is getting on a little bit. Obviously, the missing weight and whatnot. Um, lost to Dodson. Those sort of things kind of tip this in Johns' favor, from my mind. Um, I think Johns might just be kind of getting into the beginning of his prime. Uh, and... Yeah, kind of going on career trajectory here, I think. Johns' trajectory is headed upwards and Munoz might be meandering a little bit. So that's kind of what I made the play on there. It is a bit of a gamble, but I do have it covered, I'm pretty sure, with my other plays. Um, yeah. So, and then my final straight pick is uh, one unit on Henry Cejudo. He's paying $5.10. So I was just like, fuck it, I'm going to put a unit on this. Um, yeah, what sort of reasoning can you really give for a play against Demetrius Johnson? What is he on? Like 12 title defences? But my reasons for doing so are this. It is an absolute gamble. Um, it's paying ridiculous money. And yeah, I think... You know, DJ is going to lose one day, right? Maybe. But almost surely he will lose a fight one day. That happens to everyone. Um, and I don't know. Maybe this is the one. I think... So, Cejudo was pretty green in the first fight. And, yeah, he got fucking blasted. Like, DJ just wrecked him straight away. Um, but I kind of... What are we banking on here? Cejudo has looked drastically improved, particularly his boxing in recent fights. Um, he he has a super competitive mentality, I think. Um, real interesting hearing him talk about his camp and the work he's been doing in the last few years, going around the world, visiting other places. And you know, like in the end, that might not mean Jack uh, he's facing Demetrius Johnson and all that might just be for fucking nothing but I appreciate the efforts and I think he's the sort of guy I like that he's going to whatever lengths he deems necessary to try and get better than this incredible opponent um obviously his wrestling background Olympic gold medalist uh yeah speaks to his competitive nature and 
yeah, I'm just kind of hoping he does beat DJ. I'm sick of DJ as champion. I won't hide it. I don't care for Demetrius Johnson really at all. Incredible fighter, obviously. There's n n I'm not dumb enough to try and deny any of that, but I'm just... I find him kind of annoying, man. And once again, to speak to my pettiness, uh, reasons I don't like Demetrius Johnson. Uh, one is how small he is. He kind of creeps me out like a man that size. Right? Weird. And then um, I hate his pre-fight, you know, the, the, uh, with his arm. And then his celebration as well. It fucks me off like real bad. And that's obviously a personal problem I have. I don't know what's wrong with me because why should that bother me? But it really does. So, And I'm okay with admitting that. So yeah, that's that. Um, my parlays this week. So I did a layover parlay that began last week. And then that I had John Jacek and Makachev. They both came in, and this week we're relying on Moicano and Hamosh. And should that come in, I think... So I put four units on, and the odds are $2.59. So it's going to make... Uh, I don't know... Um, seven or eight units or something? Fuck, I don't know. I can't do math right now. I'm too tired. But yeah... And I believe that one's going to come in, so I'm pretty confident in that. And then I've made another parlay, a separate one on just Moicano and Harmosh to win. Put three units on that. Pretty confident both those guys are going to win their fights. Um, just, uh, I won't go into it too deep, but I just think in both cases, both those guys are better in, than their opponents in all areas. Um... I'm real excited to see them fight actually. It's so yeah, I got I got plays on three Brazilian uh guys with good kickboxing this week, so hopefully that delivers. Wish I put money on Aldo last week and could have perhaps made it four out of four. But yeah, um going into the card, what do we got here? I'll do picks for um Oh, I've done Swanson, Waikano. But I'll do picks for... Well, I've talked about Johnson and Cejudo as well. I'll talk about Dillashaw and Garbrandt in a bit. But just looking through the car, what we got? Uh, Marlon Vera. Looking forward to seeing Harmosh. Um, Perez-Torres fight could be a banger. That's a potential fight of the night, no doubt. Um... What else we got there? Bitch and Aldana. Ricky Simon versus Jackson could be fun. Munoz versus Johns. Yeah, this is a real fucking good card. Maheta Santos versus Kevin Holland. Um, yeah, Santos being a bit of an enigma, eh? I think... I thought... I'm not afraid to admit that I thought he was going to be a killer in this division, but... He's had a few setbacks and maybe isn't the guy I thought he was, but still excited to see him fight just because he's a fucking scary dude, man. Those kicks are fucking nasty. But um, getting into Dillashaw versus Garbrandt, um, it's fortunate that this fight is so exciting as a matchup because all the out of the octagon shit is so fucking tiresome man like I don't want to see these guys on a split screen arguing like fucking teenagers anymore that shit is so old so as good as they match up and how exciting that is and how much I can't wait to see them fight I'm also looking forward to the back and forth stopping maybe but it probably won't will it because either result yeah well maybe if TJ wins uh, there's not going to be too much Cody can say following that and with that I'll just give my pick now I do believe TJ Dillashaw wins this fight I think um, when I rewatched the first fight which was fucking fun what a great fight um, kind of my read on that and it's really broad read it's not very nuanced or technical or anything but so, 
I believe, like what's what's Cody's biggest asset? It's his, I think, his natural gifts. So his speed and his power, um, his eyes, real good eyes. He sees everything in there. Fuck, just thinking back to that performance against Cruz is so mind blowing. Um, never, I don't think I've ever been shocked by a fight like that before. Mm, oh, maybe Rose versus JJ was more shocking to me. Um, but yeah, he incredible natural gifts, and I think that's his that's his biggest asset. Whereas TJ. I think he obviously has great natural gifts. He's fast and powerful. Um, but I think TJ's, a lot of his biggest attributes lie within the training and the partnership with um, with Dwayne. And yeah, the coach-fighter relationship seems to be a really big part of sort of game planning, tactics, uh, that crazy style TJ has. Um, and so I think looking at going into a rematch and I saw someone saying that in title title rematches and in instances like this where one guy has won the rematch the challenger never wins or something of that nature anyhow or the stats are real bad for the challenger winning um, I think going into the rematch uh, what is going to change between last fight and this one? And I think I would give the advantage to the team who has the tactical advantage or the better the better minds for the sport, and I would give that to TJ and um, uh, Dwayne. So, yeah, in saying that, like this fight, we saw what happened in the first one. Cody caught TJ first, and... It could end up being a case of whoever catches who first. Wouldn't be surprised to see TJ employ his kicks earlier on in this fight. Saw in the first one between rounds, coach telling him, throw your kicks, don't worry about sending them up, and then he lands one. And then ultimately ends the fight in a boxing exchange, which is really supposed to be where Cody has the advantage. And... Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you see, even though that's how he got the finish, if we see TJ avoid that range a bit more. He got into the pocket a few times with with Cody, but maybe he's confident in there, So, and he seemed relatively confident in there. But So I don't really know what's going to happen in this fucking fight. I'm purely speculating, but if pressed for an answer, I'm saying TJ, and I'm saying he remains champion, which... Yeah, we shall see. It's fucking exciting, though, anyhow. Um, so that's all my picks. I may look at some props. I would like to still get my props um, percentage out of the red. But nothing is screaming at me at the moment. Uh, maybe a good prop bet will be um, uh, Johnson and Cejudo doesn't go the distance. Because five-round fight, I think, if it goes long... I w wouldn't be surprised to see Cejudo be overwhelmed with the pace and then get finished, which we often see in Demetrius fights. Or if Cejudo is to win, I think he would need a finish. So, yeah. I, yep. I, I think maybe I will go that prop bit. We shall see, see what it's paying. But it might be paying all right, given the um, weight division and whatnot. Um, just going to go into comments from the video last week, which I intended to get into. Got Blue Collar Ninja. Just listen to Touch My Heart. That's the track with a sample of dialogue from Nymphomaniac, right? Yes, it is. Dope as fuck, bro. But yeah, the bit about being petty and the other bit about betting on the most boring possible outcome gave me a chuckle. Uh... I just gamble with my dudes at work, so I really just watch your videos for the reads and breakdowns and shit. You've definitely got the knack. Well, homie, it's my day off, and there's still three or four fights from Sunday. Martin from Kentucky. Shout out, Martin. Thank you for the feedback, bro. I appreciate that shit heaps. Um, 
got a few comments here from people just saying they got fucked up last week, particularly people that betted on Antigulov like I did. Um, commiserations to all those people. Man, it sure fucking sucks, eh? Um, Jill says you could put Jeremy Stevens in the don't care segment. I certainly do. When he starts running his mouth again, I'm so happy for Jose Aldo. I love Joanna and always love to see her fight and I love her interviews. Yeah, Joanna's fucking... Probably one of the most interesting uh, interviews in the UFC, right? She's fucking crazy. Like, she gives you a, um, the impression that she's a little bit... What's the word? I'm trying to think of a nice way to put it. She's a little different, right? Her mindset is... But in saying that, like, also very much a fighter's mindset where she's kind of like a bit delusional and shit and just believes in herself um which i think you have to do in the sport um what do we got chris says worst night of my bedding worst night of bedding i've had in the last four months really about i saw quite a bit of this last week actually i'm glad i'm not alone um uh, people asking for timestamps. I still, my life is too hectic, man. It might not appear it because I'm chilling in my bedroom in the afternoon sun, but when I'm not doing this, my life is fucking crazy. Um, H Hassan says the flag on your door is dope. I don't know what it means, but it looks sick. I assume it's that flag. So there's a cool story behind that flag, actually. Um, I was in Europe. And we were on the ferry going between England and France. I can't remember which way we were going, but I guess it doesn't really matter. Anyhow, we're, so we're touring at the time, playing shows. And I was with a lot of the other people I was touring with. And we sat on the ferry and two of my friends were having a real vulgar conversation. Like super vulgar and obscene. And I looked over and there was this elderly couple sat right near us and they could hear everything they were saying. And I kind of looked over and I saw them chuckling. So I was like, oh fuck, I was like, excuse me, sorry about my friends. And they're like, nah, nah, it's fine. Um, anyhow, I got to talking to them. They were a British couple, but they lived in a, uh, I was asking where they're from and stuff. They're telling me they lived in Brittany in um, France. And so, can't remember how I first came across it, but that is the flag of Brittany, the province in France. I believe it's a province. Um, but years ago, I came across that flag and just it, I found it really uh, eye-taking. Eye-taking? Eye Catch. Fuck, I'm stupid today. Excuse me. I found it uh, very attractive, for lack of a better term. Anyhow, um... And I had a friend of mine kind of modify that flag into merch for me, for my music. That's not it. Obviously, that's a real flag. Anyhow, I explained that to them, told them I like that flag. Uh, when we are getting off the ferry, they asked me for my address. And when I was back in New Zealand, a couple months later, that flag arrived with a lovely note from those people. So shout out to them. That was such a nice gesture and real cool when strangers do really thoughtful things like that. Which is a good point. I should do more of that because I'm not super thoughtful. Um, another funny story relating to that flag too is once I tweeted that um, Mac Miller looked like Hey Arnold. I didn't even add him, but he like must have been searching his shit, and um, he he like scoured my profile and shit, and he found my version of that flag and was like, "Are oh, you?" got a flag rip off of the United States flag blah 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 and it's like bro that ain't that ain't a um, United States flag that's a flag of Brittany a place in France and dude you're on the Forbes list like why are you looking at my profile and getting upset about me saying you look like hey Arnold so in short fuck Mac Miller I'd like to fucking He's supposed to, he's, I think a few times he's supposed to have come to New Zealand and I was like, oh man, if, just fantasizing about if I saw him on the street that I could crack him, but you know, that's not going to happen. Um, further comments. Shout out David Palmer who gives really, like he 
brothers writing essays out here. Um, wrote a long message. I just I think there was it's all relating to last week, but oh yeah, so he had some insight to share about this week's fights, which I enjoyed. Just trying to find that. So, um, I say August fourth, I did Garbrandt. I think Brett Johns has value, agree, and think Cejudo has some real value, agree. I got a shit ton of parlays that have three legs clear and just need Garbrandt to cash. So if he wins, life is good. Sorry about that. Oh, I'm sure he had... Sorry. I thought he gave me a breakdown of what he thought of these week's fights in a bit more detail. Maybe not. Oh, here it is, perhaps. Ah. Oh. oh, yeah, so his thoughts on TJ and um, Cody. Is it? So I was on TJ hard the first time, straight in Impales. It was a great night. If memory serves, he opened, like, plus 165, and he came down, and came down to TJ, plus 135 or so by fight time. Cody had just got the belt, and I felt was a little too into himself at the time. He came from nothing and had his stock skyrocket after beating Cruz. Handling that level of money, fame, well, having come from so little was a tall order. This time, I think Cody is hungry as fuck. According to him and his team, he is far, far healthier and in America he is plus 100. So far better than last time. As far as skill set, I pray give the slight edge to Cody. Their wrestling games seem to cancel each other out. They both have amazing gas tanks and top-notch toughness, killer instinct. Cody's quickness and hand speed are a step above TJ's, agree. Um, and while TJ has a bit deeper of a striking arsenal and a less predictable style, I think Cody's quickness and hand speed are more valuable. Hmm, interesting. Definitely a fight that could go either way. At this point, I have like four units to 148 or so units as I've been using that on parlays in the first few. Um, so, yeah, I think this is like a supercharged version of Pearson and McDessie, maybe. <laughs> That's a, this is a ridiculous comparison, I know, but hear me out. So, McDessie had speed and precision, like Cody, and Pearson had the arsenal. But this is just a, a way higher level than that fight, perhaps. We'll see how it plays out. Um, I think that's probably all for comments this week. There's more there, but I'm just not going to go. Um, oh, Rob Waddell says, really enjoy these breakdowns. Honestly, do you not think you'll regret all those tattoos in 20 years? Nah. 20 years, I'm going to be fucking ugly either way, with or without them. Um, oh, did I address this one? This the king of Philly. He's like, there ain't no way you're clean, homie. You're either on methadone or Xanis or a combo of both, maybe Valium or Suboxone. It takes one to know one, and I know. And nah, I ain't on drugs at all, man. I think I did address this last week, eh? Because, yeah, I get piss tested for work and shit. Anyhow, um... We'll leave it at that for this week. We've gone 44 minutes. Um, just want to say I appreciate people watching heaps. Appreciate the feedback, of course. Please like and subscribe. Uh, if you haven't caught it yet, go back and watch that old podcast we did with Israel Adesanya, which is on my channel. That's really fun. Um, and, yeah, I'm going to look at booking my tickets to Adelaide for UFC Adelaide shortly. So... Have a good week. Good luck with your plays. Let's make some fucking money, all right?